My name is Piper Kerman, and I am the author of the memoir, Orange is the New Black, My Year in a Women's Prison. I was indicted in 1998, about five years after I had committed a crime. I was not sent to prison until 2004. I was released in 2005, and I've been working on criminal justice reform issues ever since. And I think that the way that public opinion about these issues has changed is quite dramatic. In 1998, we were really still in this very misguided, tough-on-crime moment. You know, the, the huge federal crime bill had passed just a few years before. Um, the crime rates were still declining, um, but we, you know, we were working on driving those down. And in the early 2000s, when I was sent to prison, you know, our prison population was continuing to rise, despite the fact that crime rates were in fact down. And they have, of course, continued to go down and down and down. And our crime rates are at historic lows at this moment in time. I think that has a lot to do with public opinion. Uh, we have many people in this country who have never experienced the high crime rates of the 1970s and 1980s because the world has changed a lot for a variety of reasons. Um, and for that reason, I think that there's a great deal of consensus that the current criminal justice approaches are outmoded and really need to change because people look at having the biggest prison population in the world, having the biggest prison population in human history. And I think across the political spectrum, there's an increasing consensus that that is a mistake. And that's not something that we want as Americans. I committed a crime, you know, in my early 20s, which is, of course, a time when, when people are often most at risk of being involved in transgressive behavior. And I was held accountable for that crime many years later. When I was indicted in 1998, I knew virtually nothing about mandatory minimums or the federal sentencing guidelines, which of course have been widely copied by the states. And I remember, as I was trying to understand my own case, being shocked and stunned at the sanctions that I was facing. Um, I took responsibility for my choices and my crime. But even so, you know, when I heard that I could potentially do more prison time than somebody who commits a violent offense uh, for my nonviolent drug offense, it was very surprising. It was very eye-opening. I thought it was important to talk about my own experience and talk about the, the people that I did time with, the women that I did time with, because to my mind, women in prison or jail offer a crystallizing example of people that we lock up in this country who we never would have locked up before. So in 1980, there were roughly 500,000 people in prison or jail in this country, and today there's 2.4 million. And during that period of time of that incredible growth of prisons and jails, women have actually been the fastest growing segment of the prison population. Now, women in prison and jail overwhelmingly uh, do not commit crimes of violence. They commit drug offenses, they commit property crimes, you know, fraud, those kinds of crimes. Um, we know what drives women's involvement in crime and drives their incarceration. And there's three really consistent things that set women in the system apart from men. And those are the experience of mental illness, a high prevalence of mental illness and mental health problems, the experience of substance abuse or addiction, and a heartbreaking overwhelming prevalence of the experience of sexual abuse or other physical abuse in women's personal histories, whether it's their childhood or their adult years. Women in the system overwhelmingly struggle with at least one of those things as part of their personal history. And those things overwhelmingly contribute to their decision to commit a crime. Um, it's important to remember that those crimes are so frequently nonviolent offenses. It's also important to remember when it comes to women in prison that the majority of female prisoners are mothers, and most of those mothers are the mothers of young children, kids under the age of 18. When we lock up a mom, it has a seismic effect on her family. Her kids are five times more likely to go into the foster care system than when we lock up a dad. And it's really devastating for a family to lose a father into prison or jail, but when a mom gets locked up, those kids are really, really at risk of being unprotected 
And so a really close consideration of what we jail women for and whether that's really a good choice is uh, long overdue. I came home from prison in 2005, and what I found is that almost to the last man and woman I knew, everyone wanted to know about the inexperience in as much detail as I was willing to share. I think that this is ironic in many ways because we send so many people away to prison and jail in this country, and it's sort of like out of sight, out of mind. People disappear behind the walls of prisons and jails, um, and many of us, many, many people forget about them. Choosing to talk about my own experience, the things that I experienced while incarcerated and the things that I witnessed while incarcerated, was important to me for a couple of reasons. Um, I felt like my experience ran counter to many of the assumptions we have about prisons and about prisoners, about who's in prison and about what really happens there, and also about why people are in prison. Um, and so I hoped that by talking about my own story, the reader might come away with different ideas about who's in prison and why are they there and what really happens behind the walls. I also was pretty confident that by telling the story of an upper middle class white woman who was incarcerated, uh, that I would be telling what is commonly called a fish out of water story. Because tragically, we know that incarceration disproportionately and unfairly affects poor people, and especially poor people of color. I was confident that if I was successful at telling my story, that I might be able to get somebody to pick up a book about prison who wouldn't otherwise read a book about prison. And I thought that was important. And I entrusted the book to Genji Cohan, to a woman named Genji Cohan, to adapt it into a series. I did that even though that was a scary thing because I knew that the potential of a television series, something that asked the viewer to commit 13 hours of their life or more, you know, there's 13 episodes per season, um, and invited the viewer to identify with these women, prisoners, who are protagonists, women who have a sense of agency, women who have complicated histories, but women who ultimately the viewer can cheer for I thought that that was really important because ultimately I think that emotion drives most human choices and that includes policy choices. So changing the emotions that we have about crime, punishment, prisoners is really important if we want to change the policies that govern all of these systems. There is a lot of room for improvement in the American criminal justice system, whether you want to talk about policing, courts, corrections and confinement uh, and alternate you know, opportunities to hold people accountable, and of course, sort of re-entry and you know, sort of community corrections. But to me, the name of the game is focusing on the front end of the system and ending the flow of humanity into our prison and jail systems when people do not need to be confined. And so making sure that we focus on reforming policing and especially that we focus on sentencing reform and making sure that our courts function the way that we expect them to. Because if you look at things like public defense in this country, you know, the right to counsel uh, is not a right that is really realized for 80% of, of defendants in this country. So those front end things and making sure that, you know, especially for young people, kids who get caught up in trouble and caught up in the system, those are all, to me, the big areas where we will see huge dividends if we focus our energy and attention. Um, so those are some of the areas of reform that I think will bear the most fruit. I am 45 years old, and the incredible growth of our prison population and the changes that we've seen in our criminal justice system have all happened during my lifetime. I am really confident that before I exit this great world, assuming that I live a long, healthy life, that we will see a dramatic change. And my greatest hope is that we will no longer have the biggest prison population in the world. I think that that is doable. I think that that is the thing that I hope for. And I believe we would be a better society if we accomplished that.